Now, <clears throat> before we get into the story, cognitive dissonance is probably one of the most well-studied phenomena in social psychology. It's probably one of the most famous theories. Personally, I think it's one of the most fascinating, and it explains a lot of our human behavior. That being said, when individuals learn about cognitive dissonance, there's incredible resistance to the idea that these mechanisms could be at play in ourselves as well. But as I'll say repeatedly over the course of this lecture, this exists in everyone. And we'll even find out later that it is true for some of the apes and monkeys as well. So we'll start this lecture with a story that's at the beginning of your chapter, which is about a cult of people known as Heaven's Gate Cult and the Halley's Bob Comet. So the Halley's Bob Comet last made its closest pass to Earth in 1997. You could see it with the naked eye if you just looked up at the sky for a whole two weeks. It was just sort of a, a rocking out smear of light in the sky. And just in case you're interested, the last time it was around was during the Egyptian dynasties, right during the Pharaoh's times, and it will not happen again for another 4,000, I believe, 300 some years. So it was a pretty rare event. Okay, so when it was in its close past, there was a cult of people made up of about 39 people, not sure if they were more who didn't take part, and they believed that in the wake of the Halley's Bob Comet, because it has a tail of ice and dust particles, that there was a spaceship following this comet, and that this spaceship would take them to their second incarnation of life, so to speak. But in order for them to make it onto the spaceship, which would, I'm assuming, beam them up in some way, they would have to get rid of their physical bodies such that their, well, either astral or heavenly or soulful bodies, depending on your school of philosophy and thought, would then be picked up by the spaceship while they would leave their physical bodies here and they would go on to live their next life. And so these 39 people performed collective and peaceful suicide. They killed themselves. I'm not sure exactly what means they used, um, but they all were ultimately just sort of lying there peacefully. The story even says they were all wearing new Nike shoes, um, which is a strange extra fact to add in. And so this was a pretty sad moment. And by itself, as unfortunate as it is to say, it's actually not that rare in human cases where we have these types of suicide cults. What is relevant to cognitive dissonance, though, is a few days before this tragic event happened, they went to a telescope store and they bought a very high powered, expensive telescope. And they took it home to ostensibly this compound where they all were, and they trained the telescope on the comet. They were able to find the comet, but lo and behold, they did not see the spaceship. So they packed up this telescope. The next day, they took it back to the telescope store and they returned it. And they were like, this telescope is defective. And of course, the person who sold it to them was a little bit confused because they asked them, well, didn't you find the comet? And they were like, yeah, we had no trouble finding the comet. And so it's like, okay, well, what's the problem? And they're like, well, we couldn't find the spaceship. And of course, the store owner is a little bit perplexed at this, but they held their ground and were like, you know, because the spaceship wasn't seen in the telescope and we know it is there, it must be that your telescope is broken. And so they were actually able to resolve this and return the telescope and well then we know what happened afterwards now it's easy to think about these people as being crazy or strange or taken in the head if you want to use that term the truth however is more complicated these people were defined by people who knew them their neighbors their family members as being relatively normal, that they were reasonable people, they were relatively rational and kind and pleasant. Not what you would think of, of someone when we have the stereotypical image of someone who has a tinfoil hat predicting the end of the world. And really what we're going to talk about here today in this lecture is the idea of how our beliefs and attitudes and even our actions can change the way we perceive and think about the world and what parts of the world or the information in it actually make it into our minds and which ones are just discredited automatically. And this is a mechanism that has some actual survival advantageous benefits, but it can also lead us astray. 
and we'll talk about that also in relation to sort of today's political climate and so on. And something please to keep in mind is that these people were like any of us. They were average in the true sense of that term. They just represented the majority of us. These were not people on the lowest end of the IQ spectrum or people who were socially isolated and thus were obsessive about sort of group cohesion or no, they were like regular people, right? People you would see on public transit or people you know or people you walk past when you're in the grocery store, right? Just regular human beings. So cognitive dissonance refers to the discomfort that people feel when two cognitions, so these can be any kind of belief or attitudes that they have, conflict with one another. And when people have this type of discomfort that arises from this dissonance, they try and reduce that state of dissonance. Now, another place where one experiences this type of dissonance is when you have engaged in some type of actions that are inconsistent with your idea of yourself. So here again, you have, it's almost, you could say the memory of what you did versus the idea of how you should be in this case are the two cognitions that are dissonant with each other. And so again, it arises that discomfort. And just like I said, we will again go and try and reduce this level of discomfort because that's just how most organisms ultimately function. Now it is very important to remember that the way in which this is reduced is not necessarily a conscious activity. It is largely mediated through our unconscious processes and is therefore not under our direct control. An analogy to think about this is hunger. So hunger is a physiological state. It is elicited when, well, through a mixture of signals that ultimately lead to the body having the realization that it requires the input of some calories. Now, when you feel like eating some food, it is relatively rare, at least in an industrialized country where people are eating solely for the sake of easing the discomfort of their stomach that has not had any food for the last two days and the person is ultimately starving. And so there is a, a deep seated physiological urge that is overwhelming. For most of us, we kind of eat when we feel like it. We feel like eating a banana or some oatmeal or whatever it is that you feel like eating and we go for it and we just eat it. And when asked about it, we just think to ourselves, oh yeah, it'd be nice to eat this thing. But we don't really think about it in terms of reducing some type of discomfort. Even though whenever we have the urge to eat some food, a lot of that originates at this physiological imbalance that the body is trying to correct by eating some food. So our subjective awareness of the experience is not nearly the complete story of what is actually going on. And this is the same for cognitive dissonance. We will be aware of some of the subjective experiences and can sometimes be aware of our own discrepancies, but largely the processes that mediate this are unconscious and outside of our control. Now, also just a note, I don't mean unconscious like you've been hit in the back of the head with a stick and you're just kind of lying there, right? Unconscious in the sense of the parts of your brain that you don't directly have access to, right? You don't see the various lines and crosses in the world as your brain is processing them, you just see letters, right? Words, even. So some of the ways in which we reduce dissonance, the first and probably the healthiest and most straightforward of them is that we just reduce one of the behaviors that arose or arises some of these dissonant cognitions. And an example of this would be, if I wanna be a healthy person and I find myself smoking, this is going to arise dissonance because I have the cognition of wanting to be healthy and I have the cognition of realizing that I'm smoking cigarettes, which is an unhealthy behavior and doing an unhealthy behavior while you want to be a healthy person are two incompatible cognitions and this will cause some degree of discomfort. Now in line with behavior change, I could just stop smoking cigarettes, throw the pack and all my tobacco in the garbage bin and then I don't have to worry about it because now I can be a healthy person and I'm not doing something that I perceive to be unhealthy. Another way in which we can resolve this dissonance is by attempting to justify our behavior in such a way that we just change one of the dissonant cognitions. We reduce its impact on causing dissonance or conflict between these two thoughts. So using the same example of I wanted to be healthy and I'm also smoking, I could start thinking to myself about, well, 
you know, smoking isn't really that bad. Sure, it causes lung damage after 20 years of smoking, and they say that's if you smoke a pack a day. I'm only really sort of a social smoker. I only smoke a few cigarettes a day, and I don't even need to smoke one right in the morning. I can wait a few hours to do it. So is it really that bad? And in this way, you're reducing the conflict between ending up being a smoker and wanting to be a healthy person because smoking isn't that bad anymore and therefore isn't conflicting as strongly with the desire to be a healthy person. And so in this way, by changing these cognitions, one can ultimately reduce this level of dissonance. Another way in which we can resolve dissonance is by justifying our behavior by adding new cognitions into this sort of mix and hodgepodge. It's kind of like if you accidentally put too much salt in a dish, you can add all kinds of other things to sort of cover up that salt. And you could add a bunch of potatoes or a little bit of lemon juice or just double all the other proportions in your recipe and it all of a sudden becomes as if there's not too much salt. This works in much the same way. So again, thinking about if I wanted to be a healthy person and I find myself smoking, I could just tell myself that, well, it's really relaxing to smoke. I know it's unhealthy, but it is really relaxing. And I know that stress is really bad for people and smoking does help me reduce stress. So even though it's kind of unhealthy, it's much better for me not to have lots of stress, which would make me even more of an unhealthy person. So if I smoke, I'll be relaxed and then I can kind of be healthy again, right? It's this added set of cognitions that lets one jump around or modify this dissonant state that allows us to reduce the dissonance that aroused in the first place from these types of dissonant cognitions. Now, another way in which we can reduce dissonance is through self-affirmations. Now, self-affirmations in the context of dissonance theory are defined as the ways of reducing dissonance by reminding oneself of one's good qualities, positive attributes. And so a way to think about this one, just sort of moving away from our example of smoking, would be if I have the belief that I should be sort of a good person and not do harm to other people, and I think of myself in that way, that I am overall a good person. And so I get into a fight with one of my friends, and I just, I'm really mean to them because, you know, I'm angry and we're in a fight and it's just like, how could you not understand my feelings? And yeah, and then you're just sort of mean to them. Now, you're likely to experience dissonance there because your behavior resulted in you doing something that is incompatible with your notion of being a good person, right? You were mean to your close friend. And so that's likely to also cause dissonance and there's gonna be a desire to reduce it. And so one way in which people can do this is they might start spending some time thinking about completely unrelated things that are in relation to their selves, themselves, and they can use that to resolve this dissonance. For example, I could be sitting there being like, I'm a good person, but I was so mean to my friend, but you know, I donate a lot to charity and I do that regularly. And by the way, I'm an excellent cook too. And I occasionally give my food to other people and cook for my friends. So how bad could I be? Yeah, I was mean, but that doesn't mean I'm not a good person. Right? So you basically use a way of patting yourself on the back and focusing on other unrelated good qualities about yourself in order to get around this state of dissonance. You know, this has some pretty dramatic implications for real life, as I mean, we saw with the Heaven Gate cult and how that all worked out, but it has much more subtle implications that pervade all of our daily lives, which I would argue is much more relevant to all of us. Now, it explains why so much of what we do isn't actually rational, because a lot of how we tend to perceive human beings sort of from an uh, outside lens or in an economic sense, right, is that human beings are just perfectly rational value maximizers. They're always calculating what's good for them and what's not good for them. And they're always choosing whatever they think is best for them in that moment. And a lot of times this is how we think about ourselves and other people in the world. And then when they're not behaving like this, we just get confused because we're like, ah, oh, these crazy people, why aren't they doing what's good for them? This is obviously what's good for them. But one has only to look at one's own behavior for a little while before one realizes that, well, most of us don't always do the best thing for us all the time, 
right? We're actually not that rational all the time. And one of the reasons is because we're constantly modifying our own thoughts and feelings in order to reduce different degrees of dissonance that come up in the world, because most human beings on the planet are not perfectly consistent with all of their actions, beliefs, and ideologies. Most of us are just a quagmire of different feelings and thoughts and reactions that go on. And a lot of times these conflict with each other. And so then we start modifying them. And once you start modifying them, that consistency and rationality is lost. It's just basically why we're not perfectly rational creatures and why you should forgive both yourself and others occasionally for not being perfectly rational because that's just not how human beings are built. It also explains why humans are so effective at rationalizing. Now, rationalizing just means our attempt to explain or justify our own or someone else's or even the world and the behavior in it, the attitudes, and we do so in logical or plausible reasons, even if those are not important or relevant to the context. And you see this all the time. You see this, so uh, a prime example of this is the current increase in flat, flat earth phenomena, where many people are trying to sort of justify in their own minds this belief that they already hold that the world is flat, not round. And thus they come up with all types of reasons why it could be that way. And while they might seem fantastical to someone who doesn't believe that ideology, a lot of what they're doing is this. They're just discarding certain thoughts that are against their philosophy, and they're focusing and modifying their way of looking at the world to justify this point of view. We'll talk much more about this in this lecture. Not about flat earthers in specific, but just this sort of asymmetry in how we find information. Oh. I guess that's mentioned here too. Um, so this also sheds lights on this. Um, so this idea that we seek out information in an asymmetrical manner. And what this means is we tend to look for information that supports our point of view. And when we come across information that does not support our point of view, we tend to disregard it or not pay that much attention to it. Because again, just thinking about how when we think of ourselves as rational beings, a rational being would go out into the world and keep their preconceived notions from happening. They would look at the information, they would weigh the information, they would evaluate logically each argument they came across. And once they had done this for a suitable number of arguments on either side of whatever the case was, they would make their decision that I believe this way or I believe that way. But most of us are not like this, even though we think of ourselves like this. Most of us have some gut intuition about this is right and that's wrong. And then we go out and we look for information that supports our point of view. This is actually much, much more common in how people go out and do things, right? Which again, just goes to this notion of at the end of the day, human beings are just not necessarily 100% rational creatures. It's not that we can't be rational, right? We can sit and solve a math or geometry equation, and we can sit and evaluate the pros and cons of moving to Seattle, for example. But at the end of the day, it's a, very important to realize that most of those types of subjective experiences that we have on a daily basis are not the result of rational deliberation. Now, there are lots of empirical demonstrations to show exactly this, this last topic we talked about, about this asymmetry of information. So a lot of experiments have looked at how we pay attention to arguments and the supporting pieces of evidence and how much attention we devote to them and how critically we examine them. And there's a whole myriad of these types of studies. And so let's just imagine that a person, you can imagine yourself here or not, as you wish, is presented with a series of arguments on either side of a position, right? So hypothetically, this is what debates are all about. And these things can be things that they care a lot about, stuff in today's world about, like, let's say, gun control or capital punishment or abortion rights or climate change and what we should do about it. And for most of these things, people have pretty strong opinions one way or another. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, as however they feel like that fits with them. And what they would do in these studies is they pick one of these topics and then they bring out some arguments on both sides, some good arguments for pro, some good arguments for con, some bad arguments for pro and some bad arguments for con. And the idea of evaluating good and bad arguments here is not just how well you think they're good or bad, but rather the way that they're logically sound and coherent and actually relevant to the topic at hand. 
And so then they would look at how people evaluated and remembered these different points of view or arguments on either side of this argument. And what they found is people tend to remember the good arguments that support their position and they remember the bad arguments that oppose their position. And think about what this does. It allows you to say, my argument has good support behind it and your argument is stupid because that's the best you've got. Even though there are an equal number of these types of pieces of information presented on both because it would arouse dissonance in our own state of mind. If you're like, okay, I believe that whatever this thing happens to be, but here's a argument for it. That's not really a very good argument at all. In fact, this is a pretty dumb argument and this is in support of my point of view, but wait, does that mean my point of view is dumb? No, 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 no. But maybe, and this is an uncomfortable state of mind to be in because most people don't actually like their points of view to be challenged, no matter how much we espouse and talk about oh, free expression and talking to each other and debate is a great way to resolve issues. Yeah, we a lot of us say this, but a lot of people don't like it when someone actually questions their beliefs and ideologies. And many people don't want to consider that they might be wrong. And this is again, just how human beings are. And so being confronted with bad arguments for your position causes us to feel this state of discomfort. Exactly in the same way as being presented with really good arguments for the opposing point of view. We don't like that either because all of a sudden you're like, wait, there's merit for this other point of view. No, they're stupid, but wait, this makes a lot of logical sense, but no, I hate them. And then you're just stuck again in this position. And so one of the most convenient ways to resolve this dissonance is to just modify your own memories. And again, remember, you're not doing this consciously, right? You're not actually going and sorting through your file cabinet being like, ha let's just shred this memory. Woo. No, it doesn't work like this. It's automatically happening. And now, so you get this asymmetry in what parts you remember. And this is true for how we devote attention to these types of arguments. We devote much more attention to the good arguments on our side and the bad arguments opposing than we do on the other two. And this is the same for how much we critically evaluate them. We are much more critical of opposing points of view than we are our own, right? So this bias exists in all different types of ways. Now, one other point to make note of is that not all arguments will have all four or situations will have all four of these types of arguments, right? Sometimes there will not be good arguments for something or bad arguments for something. And again, I don't mean this about our subjective feelings, just in the sense of logical soundness of those arguments. But this doesn't stop the asymmetry from happening, right? So let's say that there are no good arguments for my position, but the opposing side has both good and bad arguments. I will just not even think about my own side and I will just focus on the bad arguments of theirs and be like, well, your arguments are stupid. And so you can't be right, even though I have no good ones on my side. And so in this same way, that asymmetry will continue to exist, right? So if I have good arguments and bad ones on my side and they only have good arguments on the opposing side, I do the same thing. I just focus on the good arguments of mine and be like, you don't really have any arguments, even though they are good arguments there. And again, not like 100% of like you read it and you're just like, whoo, it never even made it into my mind. It's just over time, if you're asked to think about these arguments at some later point when it's not on a post-it note in front of you, chances are those ones that conflict or cause dissonance will just be more ethereal and less solid than the ones that support your point of view. Now, I've been saying this a bunch, but just to bring it back to the forefront again, these processes are largely unconscious. They're happening outside of our direct control. And in a lot of ways, this actually is helpful to us now. And this is best considered through the idea of impact bias. And this is related to affective forecasting and sort of the negative aspect of affective forecasting in terms of valence. And it refers to our tendency to consistently overestimate both the intensity and duration of negative emotional states. This just means that if I think something bad will happen, I oftentimes think I will feel bad for longer than I will feel it. And I will feel bad much more severely than I might actually feel it. And this is just a, a consistent overestimation. Now, 
it could well be that we're not actually overestimating, but we have brain mechanisms that actually modify how we think about that situation that caused us to feel bad in the first place. And that modification of how we think about it ends up making us feel less bad, which makes it resolve itself that much quicker. Right? And so in this way, this is actually quite an adaptive process because it keeps us from wallowing necessarily in our bad feelings. And so a way to think about this is, imagine you are worried about maybe getting rejected by a crush or not getting a dream job that you apply for. A lot of times before this moment has happened, we can be really worried about these things. You think your life could be not literally over, but sometimes it feels like it if your crush of long time says no to you when you're finally working up the courage to ask them out, or even this dream job that you're like, this is just going to make my whole life worth it. But if I don't get it, I'm going to feel like shit forever, basically. And then you go for it, right? You ask the person out or you apply for the job. And let's say they reject you in both cases, right? You don't get the date, you don't get the job. And now you're going to feel pretty shitty right in that moment. But now think about what happens after and try and find analogs to this in your own life. Chances are people tend to think to themselves, well, you know, I was really crushing on them really hard, but maybe they weren't quite the right person for me. I think I might find somebody who is more simpatico with me or is more right for me, or it just means it wasn't meant to be, right? And so all of these are ways to reduce in a way how much value that crush had. And by reducing the value of that crush, you no longer feel as bad because it wasn't such a big deal in the first place. Like it still feels bad, but just not as bad as you originally thought it would be. Same logic with the job, right? You thought it was a dream job. It was crushing not to get the job, but afterwards one starts to think, well, you know, that boss was a dick and working with them would suck. And I actually think that there's another job that would be so much better. And this might allow me to travel for a while. And so was it really even my dream job? And maybe I rushed into it. Maybe my parents were telling me I should. Maybe my significant others were putting pressure on me. You know, now that I think about it, it wasn't really my dream job. And in exactly this way, you reduce the value of the job which reduces how negative you're feeling about the situation. Now, in this manner, this is actually incredibly helpful because if you were always feeling really bad in the way that you expect to feel bad about certain situations, it would be pretty hard to live a lot of cases of life, especially in the early days of humanity when, I mean, disease is really relevant right now, but I mean, it's only relatively recently that we even have antibiotics and the notion of creating antivirals. I mean, if you think about a couple hundred years ago, and then even worse to several thousand years ago, I mean, it was kind of your luck basically, and you tried to eat some food if you were privileged enough to eat that food. But a lot of bad shit happened to people for pretty much no reason. And if you really sat and dwelled on it, especially with the human being's intellect, it would be pretty crushing. We might all just run around being depressed. And not in the sense of like clinical depression, but just in the sense of like the world's weight would just be very weary. And in this way, this is probably one of the ways in which we allow ourselves to cope when tragedies happen or when things that are just unexplainable and negative happen. And it allows us to just keep moving forward. So one of the places where one sees dissonance the most, well, maybe not necessarily the most, but rather where the discomfort is the most, is when one of the dissonant cognitions is about oneself. And this ultimately results in experiencing much more negative emotionality and much more serious ways of being able to reduce this dissonance when one of those things is about ourselves. So a way to think about this would be, I'm likely to experience a very negative state if I'm confronted with the fact that I just ate a whole bag of large, a large bag of potato chips, and I also perceive myself to be a healthy person. Now I am a healthy person, but I just did something that makes me realize the fact that I did something totally unhealthy. And having to reconcile these two things oftentimes will make us feel pretty bad. Maybe you don't really worry about potato chips, but at the end of the day, what we're really going after here is that cognitive dissonance is at its peak when one of the two dissonant things is about ourselves. 
Now, an empirical example to sort of demonstrate how much of an impact our thinking about ourselves can have, here was a study conducted by Aronson and Met in 1968. The paper is called Dishonest Behavior as a Function of Differential Levels of Induced Self-Esteem. So here you had participants come in and they were sorted into three different groups. All of them took a personality inventory and then they received different types of feedback. Now this feedback was completely bogus. It wasn't actually the results of the test that they took. That was just basically a sham so that they could give this feedback. So a third of the people were given positive feedback to boost their self-esteem, sort of how they think about themselves. And they were told stuff like you're interesting and you're deep and you seem mature for your age and stuff like that. Another third of people were told something negative about themselves, that they're completely uninteresting, they're boring compared to the average, they're not really going to do very much according to their personality and so on and so forth. The remaining third received no feedback whatsoever and they served as a control. So the idea here is that you're getting people to think negatively about themselves. That's sort of their cognition right now about themselves. And then also you have some who you're boosting that self-esteem, thereby making their view of themselves more positive. So after receiving this feedback, they took part in another quote unquote unrelated study, even though it was part of the same study. And in this, they played a card game and they were actually given the opportunity to cheat in this card game against their sort of hypothetical opponents. And this would allow them to win a bunch of money. But in order to win the money, they would have to cheat. And so they looked at how and how frequently did people cheat and did the condition of their feedback make any difference to their likelihood of cheating? Now, it should be said that in all groups, some people cheated and other people did not. That's just kind of how it went. That being said, the people who were in the positive self-esteem condition actually cheated the least, while people in the low self-esteem condition cheated the most. Now, please don't take this to mean that if you have high self-esteem, you're a good person. And if you have low self-esteem, you're a bad person. That's not what we're talking about here. So think about this in terms of cognitive dissonance. If you're cheating, chances are you don't think cheating is a good behavior. Now, if I've just boosted your self-esteem, chances are you think more highly of yourself. And most of those are related to generally positive or good attributes. So if you're thinking more highly of yourself and you have the temptation to cheat, that's going to be pretty dissonant. And this might actually result in you cheating less because it doesn't fit with this current state of mind of being a really good and high esteem person. Whereas the opposite is true if your self-esteem takes a huge hit, right? It's here now, I'm maybe not that great a person because I was basically told I was uninteresting and not really gonna amount to anything and yada, yada, yada. Not saying it's true, right? Just this is what they induced in that person at this moment. And now when they have the opportunity to cheat, which is technically speaking wrong, they, in their own minds, don't have as big a divide between being in a relatively negative state of mind and then cheating because in their view, or if one was to just look at it, if I'm kind of a meh person as it is, what's the big deal if I cheat a little bit? It's not like it's that big a deal, right? It's, we don't get as sort of bent out of shape when we see a, a hooligan perform some silly task, but if we see a saint perform the same task, we all of a sudden lose our shit a little bit, right? It's the conflict and that contrast changes how we are likely to behave. And so here you're seeing that when you modify how someone is looking at themselves, it will actually change their behavior in a meaningful way, right? This is something cheating behavior is nothing to take lightly. And all they did is give them a sham personality test. And that was enough to change in that moment, at least people's self-esteem. It's likely not to be enduring, but nonetheless, it's pretty amazing that you can change this type of behavior. So for example, Las Vegas could give everybody really, really good feedback on random personality tests that they just decide to give, and they might save a bunch of cheating behavior. Or likewise, a professor who is about to take a class could heighten everybody's self-esteem through some interventions, and the likelihood is that that class will actually cheat less. All right, so here's a more, I guess, impactful real life example. So this was conducted by Cohen et al, in 2009, and the paper is called Recursive Process in Self-Affirmation, Intervening to Close the Minority Achievement Gap. 
Now, what they're talking about, about the minority achievement gap is specifically about academics, but one sees this in lots of different domains, that a marginalized community, if they have certain types of negative stereotypes around them and that is manifested in the world in which they live, the community will tend to internalize some of those negative stereotypes. It's just, it's unfortunate, but it is something that seems to happen. It's the same way as if you have abusive parents who continually tell their children that they don't really have much worth. Even though there's no objective bearing there, those children will grow up thinking that they have less worth than the average person. It's just one of the products of living in an environment that is not welcoming or conducive to you and tells you that you're wrong or you're not good enough continuously, which is in many cases what minority and marginalized communities deal with on a daily basis. Now, this is especially true in academic performance, and this particular study is looking at how this relates to African-American participants along with European Americans as controls. Now, these some studies have been done on other ethnicities and races, but when studying race, especially in branch of psychology, people tend to look at the differences between European and African-American people by far the most. Um, the others are gaining some traction in literature, but still tend to be absent compared to these two. Now, before we get into understanding these graphs, it's important to think about how this can lead to dissonance. So if one has negative concept around one's own academic behavior, right, for example, think that I'm a person who's like, I'm not good at math, right? I have a negative self-concept around my mathematical aptitude. If I'm working really hard to get better at math, this is going to likely cause dissonance. Because if you're just not good at math inherently, why would you spend time practicing? At best, you're just a, a foolish person for wasting your time practicing something that can never be better. And at worst, you'll tend to think, why am I even doing this to myself? All I'm doing is proving to myself over and over how bad I am at math. And this will cause a lot of dissonant behavior. And a lot of times we don't change the self-concept, we'll just stop practicing and not do the work, which is really detrimental because not practicing a skill is one of the ways in which you don't get good at the skill because most skills require that you practice. That's just kind of how it goes, right? I mean, even something you take for granted, like using a utensil to get food into your mouth, wasn't always easy. And if you doubt that, just look at a really tiny baby that's learning to eat. They get half their food all over their face, right? Everything takes practice. But if you believe you're never going to be able to do it, you're probably not going to practice because that makes one feel fairly uncomfortable. One doesn't find this if you have positive self-concept around academic performance, because then you're like, okay, maybe I don't get this now, but I have no doubt that I'll eventually get this. And so the failure is no longer bad, and practicing is also no longer a waste of time because it's in pursuit of just continuing to be good at something and learning to be better. This is why when people internalize a negative concept around their own academic performance, it can be so damaging in actual real life because they'll go on to ultimately have poor academic performance, which is just sad because that just keeps this loop going in this horrible perpetual cycle. Now, you can ignore these two sets of lines. We're not going to talk about what covariated adjusted means, but or means means. <laughs> but if ever you want to, one day you can come to office hours and we can talk about that. So basically the real comparison that we're looking at is this set of people versus this set of people. So this line up here, this is GPA across two years. This is representing European Americans who were collapsed across performance. And this also includes high performing African American folk who are also in two different types of conditions. People who are controls, nothing has happened to them. And people who have affirmations who were given some kind of boost to their self-esteem around academics by taking them through a guided writing program. And they were able to ultimately work through why it is sort of nonsensical in a way. Maybe that's not a good word. It's designed to help one have a better sense of oneself. Now, here you can see there's really not much difference that happens across either race or of affirmation type, right? People just tend to have slightly good performance at the beginning. And then sadly, they just start doing worse and worse over the course of these two years. The thing that one is taking away from this is it's not important that these performances are as far down as they are. That's not the exciting part here. What matters here is that there's a difference in this line versus this line. The dark black line up here is representing people who received this affirmation 
while this set here is representing the control group who did not receive that affirmation. And you can see that the group that did not receive the affirmation, their performance tends to degrade quite rapidly and continuously over the course of those two years. While those who received that positive affirmation, while there is still a decline, which is common to all students, it seems like, their decline is actually at a lower rate, not only than their peers who were of the same performance category, but had no affirmation, but this rate of decline is actually a shallower slope than up here, which is quite something. And then it is across two entire years, even though there was one single affirmation. Now, while maybe it doesn't seem like a crazy thing to hover around a GPA of two, that's not really what's important here. The thing that matters is something as simple as changing how a person perceives themselves can have impacts that are one long ranging over the course of two years and change feedback one gets on one's own performance, which is likely to also additionally allow one to modify or update one's self-concept, right? It's, it is unbelievably dangerous actually to have these types of negative self-concepts about oneself because it causes us to act in certain ways that ultimately will reduce how much effort we're willing to put in and how severely we will take failure which in many ways can keep us in this negative state of being. Now, you might be asking about the difference in performance here and why they didn't talk about European Americans who are at this performance level. Chances are they are European Americans at this performance level. They just didn't include them here. We also don't know about where this study is being conducted in what types of schools. We don't know anything about the households or average income of these people. So it is very important to also remember that it's not just you're going to make everybody feel good about themselves, like either through affirmations or medication of some kind and everybody's performance is going to be great, right? It's not that simple. We're just talking about how the fact of having negative opinions about yourself will keep you from engaging in positive behaviors because a negative image about yourself and positive actions and behaviors will arouse dissonance and dissonance is uncomfortable and we'll try and change it but we don't often change our own self-concept. And so we will change our practice and effort behaviors because they're not in line with this negative self-concept. When it comes to these types of self-esteem interventions, the thing that is really the most important of all is they have to appear genuine, right? It's, I mean, they should be genuine, right? But like they have to at least appear it because that's how it works. If they don't, it's likely to backfire. If it backfires, it's actually gonna hurt performance even more than originally was happening. And it doesn't matter if this is you doing it to yourself through self-affirmations or somebody else is telling you affirmations to make you feel better about yourself, right? So in this case, for just sort of like a real life thing to keep in mind, getting yourself pumped up in the mirror is great if that's something that works for you. But if somebody is depressed or not feeling good or feels ugly or not smart or any of these types of things, please do not tell them to go stand in front of a mirror and tell themselves about how pretty they are, or smart they are, or attractive they are, or whatever it is, right? You're actually not gonna be helping them if they have low self-esteem because what's gonna happen is they already have a negative image about themselves, which is hard enough to deal with, regardless of whether it's true or not. And then you stand there in the mirror and you tell yourself, I'm really smart, even though you don't actually think you're smart. Now you're looking at yourself in the face while you don't believe what you're saying and you're still saying it. So at best, you're a liar who's lying to themselves all the while you're not being smart, which is just gonna make someone feel even worse, right? So be really careful. One hears this stuff all the time of just say good things to yourself. Yeah, you should be kind to yourself, but that's just, different than telling yourself nice, pretty accolades and platitudes, because unless you believe them, it's not actually gonna help you. So be really careful about this because this type of advice gets thrown around a lot. And like I said, it can be helpful if that's something that works for you, but don't just go using this as like a one shot cure all kind of thing, because for a lot of people, it will hurt them more than it will help them. Now we're gonna start talking about cognitive dissonance and decisions and some pretty interesting ways in which we see certain decision biases that arise. And a lot of those are because of cognitive dissonance. And so we'll talk about three. We're gonna talk about sort of equal pair decisions and how it changes our opinions of those decisions. And this is referred to as post-decision dissonance. 
we'll talk about how changing the degree of permanence in a decision will actually change how we feel about our choices. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about moral decision making. And a lot of times we talk about ethics and the ethics that we have will shape our decisions. This time we're going to take the fun perspective of our decisions themselves will change our very morality. So post decision dissonance refers to the dissonance that's aroused after making a decision, typically between two very equally valued options. You'll tend not to find this when a decision is easy, and by that I just mean one thing is obviously preferred over the other. This is also sometimes called choice support, depending on what type of literature you're looking at. So one of the most famous and original of these was conducted by Braham in 1956, and the paper is called Post-Decision Changes in the Desirability of Alternatives. And here, you had a group of participants who were asked to rate a series of small appliances, so it's stuff like toasters and blenders and stuff like that, in terms of attractiveness and desirability. So how attractive were they and how much do you want them, basically. And after they made all of these ratings, they were given a choice between any two of these items and they were told, okay, uh, between these two items, which one would you like to have? You can take it home with you free and clear. And so people would make their decision between these two items. Now, the trick was that these two items were always chosen from the ratings that they had made. And they were two items that they chose to be roughly equal in terms of attractiveness and desirability. So ultimately, as far as liking and wanting goes, it was about equal for both of those items. Now, they get to make their choice. They have now the thing they're about to take home. But now, before they can actually take it, they're told, well, could you please rate everything just one more time on those same dimensions, just so we can see what happens? So they do, and then they can take their toaster or blender or whatever the appliances were in 1956 home with them. Now, the results of the second rating were quite interesting. So for the most part, most of their ratings about the appliances all stayed the same. What was fascinating is the ratings for these two items that were involved in the choice. Now remember, these were both valued about equal. Now what happened is, for the item that got selected, it got a bump in ratings. So all of a sudden it was more attractive and desirable than it was when it was originally rated just a little while prior. And the item that was rejected actually took a hit to attractiveness and desirability. And even though it was just rated a little while before, all of a sudden it was no longer as good a decision or item as it was before the decision was made. And here in a way what's happening is there really is no way to choose between two things that are equally valued, right? It's just, you could flip a coin and pick one or the other. Of course, we don't like to think of ourselves in this random way. And so what actually tends to happen is after you've made a decision, you come up with reasons for why making that decision was the right decision. But there are no actual objective facts because both things were about the same. And so what tends to happen is people come up with then reasons to support why the choice they made was the good one and why the thing they rejected was the bad one. Now, in a real life context for all of you to take is that while it is Im exceedingly important really, I think, to think about your decisions and to make informed decisions, if you're making life decisions, stuff like where to go for graduate school or whether to move to a different city to live or to take this or that job, and you kind of value a couple options equally and you're kind of stuck, don't worry about it so much because you'll choose one, well, hopefully you'll choose one, and after you make your choice and you go for it, your brain is going to convince you that that was the right decision to make all along and the other one was totally not. And since you'll never really know, there's no sense in worrying about it. So if you find yourself stuck in a set of decisions that are basically the same, regardless of whether you go this way or that way, it might not hurt you to just flip a coin and go for it. Now, when it comes to decision permanence, there are some interesting differences that happen in how we think about our decisions after the fact. Now, research has indicated that the degree to which a decision is perceived as permanent has a strong impact on how we feel about the decisions that we're going to make and have had made already. So Knox and Inkster in 1968 
have a paper called Post Decision Dissonance at Post Time. And this study was conducted at a horse race gambling track. And they basically stayed outside a $2 bet window. And what this means is just this window particularly catered to $2 bets. And so you could only make bets that were $2. And you couldn't add or take away from this. It was just, you went, you bet two bucks on something, and then you were like, okay, great. Now, what they wanted to know was how confident people were in their bets, right? Which horse they chose to win or to be third or however that works. And they wanted to know how confident people were. The two conditions are, they asked half the people how confident they were that their horse would win or whatever they're betting on right before they made their bets. So they're walking up to the window, but not quite at the window when they're stopped by the researcher to be like, yo, how sure are you? The other half of people, they asked them right after they made their bets. So they just go place their bet, they turn around to walk away, and the researcher is like, yo, how sure are you that you're going to win? Or whatever. Right? So all that's different is right before and after. And it's unlikely that anything is changing with the significant odds of the horse races within that couple of minutes that someone made their bet. The crazy thing is, it turns out that people are much more sure about their bet after they've made the decision than before they've made the decision, which is pretty wild, right? And one of the ways in which this can be explained by a dissonance is that before you've made a decision, you could still change it, right? You can go this way or that way. But after you've made your decision, you can't change it anymore. And if you start to second guess yourself, well, that's not going to feel so great because you're just basically questioning your own decision making capabilities. And so one way in which you can reduce the degree to which you question yourself is to just make yourself feel more sure about the decision you made. Because the more sure you feel about the decision, the less you have to question yourself. And the less you question yourself, the less likely you are to feel uncomfortable questioning the fact that maybe you didn't make a good decision. And so decisions that can't be taken back, we tend to feel much more sure about the action that we took, regardless of whether that was a good action or not. Now, again, please, it's important to know that we're not speaking about every single human being, right? There are some people who will make an irrevocable decision and feel like shit afterwards because they're like, did I do the right thing or not? And that's normal. That happens to people too, right? What we're talking about is on averages here. For most people in most decision-making scenarios, the more permanent it is, the more sure we'll feel about the decisions we had to make in that context. Another example of this comes from Gilbert and Ebert in 2002. The paper was called Decisions and Revisions, the Affective Forecasting of Changeable Outcomes. Now remember, affective forecasting just refers to how well we can predict our own emotional state at some time in the future as a result of some type of event. Now, this experiment was conducted in tandem to a photography class. So this was kind of set up as study photography and psychology at the same time. And students learned about photo photography in this. And on the final day, it took some pictures that they were able to print out. And they printed out two photos that they liked. And the important thing here is that on average, they liked the two photos they printed out equally. They were allowed to keep one of those photos, though they were told that the other photo would be kept by the department. Now, half of the people were told that the photo that they chose, that would be it. They could have no take back, so to speak. While for the other half, they were told that they would be able to call in a week later and say, you know, I'm not that happy with my photograph and I would like to exchange my photo. So they all take their one photo, they head home. A few days later, the experiments call the experimenters call everybody. And they're like, okay, how happy are you with your photograph? And interestingly enough, people who are in the no exchange condition who couldn't take their photo back were happier with their photos than those who had kept their options open who had been like oh maybe i'd get to change my photo now interestingly enough this is not what people expect to be the case most people when you ask them they think that they'll be happier in the future if they're able to keep their options open and not have to make a serious or committed decision Whereas it turns out when one tends to make decisions that you can't take back, we are ultimately happier with those decisions on average. 
Now, of course, this is not true of every single decision. There are some decisions that we all wish we could take back, but that's just how it is, right? But again, on average, when you're able to keep returning something, you're probably not gonna like that thing as much as if you have to just pick and buy something. And again, the reason this is happening is due to dissonance, right? Something you cannot take back, you have to justify why you chose it in the first place. And the most likely way in which to do that is to convince yourself that it was worth it in the first place, right? This is why if you are fooling around in relationships and the idea is you're keeping your options open constantly and not actually making a decision, your chances are we'll never like any of those people as much as if you actually make a committed decision. Not saying you shouldn't fool around if that's your thing, but just note that at the end of the day, that's probably not going to make you as happy as choosing one person if monogamy is the thing that you're into. Because not everybody is into monogamy, right? For some people, polyamory is a wonderful way to live their lives, but they're not actually fooling around keeping their options open. They just have committed relationships with more than one person. It's not the same thing. This does lead also this similar fact to a type of sales pitch scam scheme called lowballing. This refers to the strategy whereby salespeople induce a customer to agree to a purchase for an item at a low cost and then subsequently say that there was a mistake that it was at this low cost and the actual cost is a little bit higher than what people originally thought it was going to be. Now, this works through three ultimate mechanisms and it is unbelievably effective actually, which is a little too bad, but hopefully after learning this, you will be sort of forewarned and defended against. Now, the way it works, imagine you're at a car dealership because that's where this originated in my understanding at least. You go in, you're committed to buying a car, let's say it's a Toyota or a Ferrari, okay, whatever. Um, you go in, you get a car, you're there for this car, you've looked it around, you've priced it out, you're like, okay, let me check. And the person, the salesperson is like, you know what, for you, the price of this is going to be 500 bucks cheaper than it is what you expected, what's listed as what's everywhere else. And you're like, holy shit, that's great. I'm about to get $500 off on this car. Go me. And so then the person says to you, well, okay, so can you write a down payment check now that I can go show the manager that you're a serious customer and that way I can get you the discount. And so you're like, okay, here's the check for a couple grand on the Honda or a couple tens of thousands for the Ferrari or whatever the heck those cost. And the person goes into the back of the showroom, spends a little time, probably just drinking a cup of coffee or something, comes back out with a sort of sad look on their face. It's like, you know, I was talking to my manager about it and they spotted a math error I made. And the actual price is actually $200 higher than the original price was, right? So they basically went and were like, I'll give you a discount. And now they're telling you that it's actually more expensive than you thought. And what happens is most people will agree to buy the car or blender or whatever the heck it is. And the reason this happens is because people have already made a commitment in their mind. They've already made a decision. And because they think they've made a decision, they think the situation is permanent. This is again, dissonance at work right? Just in the opposite direction of what we were talking about earlier, right? You gave them a down payment. And so you're like, Oh, I've already done it. I have the car now, which is not technically true. You can be like, yo, give me my money back. That's not what we agreed to. Uh, I'll see you at never. <laughs> right. Another way in which this commitment is solidified is because you start imagining to yourself how great it's going to be to drive away in that Honda or Ferrari or use that blender or whatever it happens to be. And once you've already started imagining all the things you're going to do with whatever the thing is later that afternoon, in your mind, you've already made the decision. And it's even harder to then say, you know, actually, I'm not going to buy this product right now. And a way to think about this is if you have recently had a package delivered to you by UPS and they're like, we'll totally deliver it today. And then they don't deliver it that day and it shows up the next day. Normally, we're pretty peeved about this and are like, come on, you said you were going to deliver it. I was looking forward to playing with whatever it is you order instead of if they had just in the original time and said like, you know, we're sorry, we're not going to be able to ship it in five days. It's going to take six days. You'd be way less mad if they just told you, ah, it'll take six days a day extra, assuming it's not time sensitive. Then if it comes to the day where you think you're going to get it and then you don't get it, 
as soon as you start imagining you're going to have something, it's a real letdown not to get it, which is just what makes that commitment seem even stronger. Finally, this only works if the inflated price is a little bit higher than what the standard market price was, right? If you make a Honda all of a sudden be $2 million, it's not going to work, right? But be aware that this is a strategy that gets used in sales and marketing all the time, right? It's one of the reasons why no one ever tells you tax and shipping when you're making online purchases, right? Not quite the same mechanism, but underlying this is one of those similar things or why stuff that's $9.99 is easier for us to buy than something that's $10 whole. Right? It just seems less. And we convince ourselves we're getting a deal because ultimately we do a lot of work behind the scenes convincing ourselves of all types of things. Finally, let's talk a little bit about moral decision making. So before we get into the actual study here where they looked at this, many people hold the schema that immoral choices are done by immoral people and moral choices are made by moral people. Basically, this is the idea that bad people do bad things, they make bad choices, and good people do good things, they make good choices, right? A lot of people believe this. Now, it's largely contextual, right? Sometimes people steal because they're starving, not because they're bad people, right? The real world is rarely so cut and dry. Oftentimes, things are far more complicated than they appear at first glance. Now. Second, the thing we're going to start talking about today is it's not just that a good decision is done by someone who's good, but rather if you make good decisions, you'll come to believe you're more of a good person. Just like if you do make a lot of bad decisions or immoral ones, you'll tend to start to believe that you're more immoral than you originally were, which is not exactly how most of us tend to think about ethics, morality, and decision making. So here's an example where Mills in 1958 conducted a study with sixth graders, a lot of sixth graders, so a total of 20 classes of them. The paper itself is called Changes in Moral Attitudes Following Temptation. And so the way this worked is all of these students were given questionnaires that evaluated how they felt about cheating. So some were like, I hate cheating. Others were like, cheating is not that bad. And probably most of them were kind of in the middle where it's like, ah, eh, you know, there'd be time, sure, but I don't think it's that great. After they had given their attitude questionnaire, they were put in a situation where they had to take a highly competitive test. Um, this consisted basically of certain types of number guessing and dot guessing, um, which don't sound like that complicated guesses, but they were designed to be catchable in terms of cheating, which we'll talk about in a second. So they were highly competitive in that you got prizes for your performance, you could basically lose all of your effort if you made even small mistakes. So it was pretty high stakes and you got some cool prizes i think they even gave these sixth graders five dollars um, which might not seem like a lot to you because that's how much like a coffee costs sometimes but in 1958 that was a big deal and they could probably buy candy to their heart's content um, at that time again of course so it's made kind of competitive not everybody can win in fact only very few people can win and it would ultimately be really difficult to actually do well on in the time that was given to them. Now, they did set these structures. Now, if you read the study, you'll see that they use two different paradigms because it was difficult to tell who was cheating in the first paradigm. And so they switched over to a different type of dot guessing task where it was easier to catch people cheating. But so they set it up such that people could cheat, but it was made in a way where you as the experimenter could see and know that they were cheating but the students perceived as if they couldn't be caught cheating. So you're basically giving them all the opportunities you can to be able to cheat. And so, as you would guess, some people cheated, other people didn't. That's just kind of how it went. But probably many of the people considered it at some point, because lots of people consider it. Very few of us are so pure of mind that we would never even consider something bad. Right? It's doing it is a different matter. A few days after this, they gave them another attitude questionnaire to once again see how they felt about cheating. And here we see something very similar to how people were changing their impressions of toasters and blenders, except when it came to their views of cheating. And so here what happened is people who cheated had a more favorable outlook on cheating, meaning they were like, yeah, cheating is not actually as bad as I actually thought it was. Of course, they're not comparing to their original attitude. They genuinely don't think cheating is as bad as they originally did after they have in fact cheated. Whereas those who refrained from cheating 
actually had more of a sort of severe reaction towards cheating, where they're like, you know, cheating is actually really bad, not just pretty bad. And in this way, the decisions that they make will actually change their attitudes and beliefs. And in this case, their very moral structures. And you can imagine this will keep going then, right? Because if you then are put in another situation where you don't cheat and you're like, okay, I'm not going to cheat. You then think cheating is even worse and you'll keep going until you get to a place where you basically think that cheating is the most evil thing ever. And maybe not to that extreme, but it will tend to get worse and worse. Just like the more you cheat, the easier it is to rationalize this and the less bad you will think cheating happens to be. And this is not limited just to cheating. This is across the board in almost every single domain of our moral structures of what things are considered to be good and what things are considered to be bad. And I suppose you might have your own personal beliefs about that there is some true good and true bad in the world. But until that is determined and given to us in some objective proof way, at the end of the day, we're the ones who are defining what things count as good and what things count as bad. And the way we define them is constantly changing by our actions. Now, towards the end of this section, it's important to note that cognitive dissonance exists pretty much everywhere. As far as I know, there is not a single culture anywhere on the planet that does not show the patterns of cognitive dissonance. It's pretty much fundamentally wired into all human beings. In fact, even monkeys and apes show exactly the same patterns. You can make them choose arbitrarily between different colored candies that taste identical, and they will begin to start showing a preference for the candy they chose in the first place and discounting the other. Some people think this might be related to evolutionary survival, where if you have something that works, stick with what works and don't try new things, but it might be more complicated than that as well. Interesting, there's some cool neuroimaging literature I'm right now in the middle of reading this article, and it's a little bit of a doozy, actually. But hopefully I will get to the end of it and see a little bit more about what they're talking. Now, the study, at least according to your textbook, was conducted by Weston et al. in 2006, and it had people evaluate political statements. So this was generally around uh, the second Bush president. And they found that when people were confronting dissonant statements, so sort of like if you're a Democrat and they're like, Republican presidents are awesome. Or if you were a Republican and they were like, Republican presidents are stupid, right? In both cases, these would be a dissonant statement for your outlook on the world. They found that when confronting these types of statements, their prefrontal cortices showed far less activation than when they were dealing with consonants or agreeable statements. And remember that your prefrontal cortex is largely involved in analytical and complex abstract reasoning. So basically wherever you would reason through the logic of something. And so what this is implying is that as soon as you come across something you don't like, you basically shut down that logical portion of your brain. And as soon as you come to something you do like, you turn that back on again. So remember how we were talking about what parts of an argument people tend to remember and what parts they ignore? We're literally seeing brain activation that fits with that sentiment. Further, they showed that the emotional circuits that we have the negative ones tend to get quite aroused, basically fear and aversion responses when we're dealing with some kind of dissonant information. And as soon as we resolve it, meaning ignore it or think it's stupid, our positive emotional circuits seem to light up. And basically this just rewards us for this behavior over and over. So quite literally, our brains are determining that certain things are against us the way we would like them to be. And so just don't devote very much attention to them. And I would ask you to consider this in terms of today's political climate, where basically both sides are just ready to throw shit at each other without saying any words anymore. And perhaps it is worth considering how much of the fact that we are no longer paying any attention whatsoever to actual arguments on either side of the divide. And instead it's just let our negative hatreds for each other overwhelm everything because no one is actually talking anymore about the logic of being on one side or the other. All it is anymore is just two sides with two groups of people. And well, to be frank, that's not really a good way to run one country. Huh? Finally, about culture, the one difference that we do see across the board 
is there are different types of attitudes and beliefs that lead to the dissonant behaviors or the arousal of dissonance and then behaviors to resolve them. But at the end of the day, dissonance exists everywhere. It's just kind of the things that get it going the most are slightly different. For example, in the West, we tend to have high degrees of dissonance when it's related to something about ourselves. Whereas in the East, that tends to be not as highly as a dissonance arousing situation. Yet when someone has a dissonant belief or attitude around the group in an Eastern or holistic country, that tends to arouse much more dissonance than it does in the West. Not that both don't arouse dissonance, it's just asymmetrical in how much it causes. But ultimately, cognitive dissonance is found everywhere. And it is one of the reasons or mechanisms by which we will convince ourselves that we're not as susceptible to cognitive dissonance as everybody else. Because then we have to confront our own limitations and no one likes to do that and it makes us feel uncomfortable. And so we will use cognitive dissonance to perpetually make ourselves feel like we're not as susceptible to cognitive dissonance, which is a crazy type of irony. But hey, the more you know,